Hey, it's Tim Kawakami here, Four Nerds Plus Minus, with my co-host Matt Barros. We are recording this Friday morning, uh, the night after the 49ers selected a receiver, not the one I'd ever really heard of, heard of Ricky Pierce, all in the first round, 31st pick. Much other drama surrounding it. I think this is, a, I'll admit, this is a little bit of a gamble to record this now, because if the 49ers make a major move, say by trading a receiver that we all have heard of, Today, in the second or third round, we will have to go turn around and record another one, Barrows, right. which I would prefer not to do. But no, listen, hey, whatever the news takes us, it's just a matter of where we're going to record this morning or not. I just think there's enough to chew on today. And I'll take that bet uh, that if, if there's something else happens, we'll record again. But uh, this one will be up and for last all of eternity for people to, to tell us we were right or we were wrong. Barrows, your feelings after the first round, after we listened to... Uh, Shanahan and Lynch talk talk to us. Uh, whatever else you've heard, you report a little bit about what the trade offers might have been for Ayuk. Where are you on where are the Fortners are with the receiver situation after last night? Yeah, um, you know, it, it wasn't a shock to me that they drafted a receiver. Um, as you'll recall, my draft crush, mm -hmm. Adnai Mitchell, who's still out there, by the way. Yeah, you nailed um, that is, one. Is a receiver, and so I sort of laid out the logic of that. Um, why taking a receiver in round one uh, might be a smart move for this team because next year is so fuzzy at the wide receiver position. You don't have uh, Brandon Ayuk signed yet uh, for next season. You don't have Juwan Jennings signed yet for next season. You've got an out in Debo Samuel's contract um, next off season. So that's what uh, why I thought it was probably pretty smart to take a receiver early on now, does that mean that one of those guys is is going today? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I can see the uh, the logic of doing it. You get something for Debo Samuel now instead of getting nothing from him later. The illogic of that is that you get nothing from Debo Samuel on the yes. field yes. during a year in which you um, want to go back to the Super Bowl and avenge your loss to the Chiefs. And uh, Ricky Pearsall is uh, is talented. I like Ricky, Ricky Pearsall. Um, I watched Ricky Pearsall um, a lot back in, I don't know, it must have been February when we first started to have to, to write uh, some draft stories. And I thought he was really good. And I thought he was probably uh, a mid-second round pick. Um, he does some of the same things that Debo Samuel does. Florida, you know, had him do end arounds, uh, lots of tunnel screens. Um, you know, he's, he's a quick mover. He's not Debo Samuel. He's not bullying over people. He's not kind of taking control of a game, intimidating teams, getting into teams heads like D Debo Samuel has done time and time again. So it would be a big risk for this team, uh, to, to say, okay, now that we got Ricky Pearsall, let's, let's, uh, <laughs> let's see what we can get for, uh, for Debo Samuel. You don't need that guy. You don't need that guy who what ran for four hundred yards and 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 you know caught for twelve hundred that couple of years ago. You don't. Need yeah, that. I mean we can go back to his magical twenty twenty one season. I haven't seen anything like that since I've been covering this team. Uh, so um, that's why it makes me skeptical that they would do it. Um, it seems to me that Plan A, perhaps parting ways with Debo Samuel next off season, next March, um, is is the better course. And, and you see if you can run it back again with this crew that you have. One of these guys is going to get hurt during the season. There'll be opportunities for Ricky Pearsall to come in. Ricky Pearsall will be your punt returner. Ricky Pearsall will be on your, um, your, your punt uh, coverage unit. There'll be places to sprinkle him in. You have him for five years. Again, it takes a year in the Shanahan system for these receivers to kind of get up to speed. Uh, so that's what that's what I see 2024 being for Ricky Pearsall. We'll see what happens later today. The big picture of this, which I thought of this morning, and fortunately not in time to put in my column that I wrote, which is posted on The Athletic this morning, but I wrote it last night, was that once the first round was over, I think that was the window to trade Ayuk. Oh, yeah. They weren't going to trade him for anything less than a first round pick. Probably a good first round pick. I mean, I know that's, you know, it could have wavered depending on who was on the board. But once the first round got through, that was the IUK section of the trade discussion. Now that they're on to the second day, 
I think that's the Debo section of the conversation. Now, I wish I had thought of it that clearly, but um, that's, I think it came through. I think it came through in kind of the way Shanahan's specific, oh, you know, as you know, Kyle's always more, like more to the point than John in, in these situations. Um, he's blunter. He's like to the point. Lynch, you know, has his has, has his answers and they're interesting to listen to, but Shanahan is certainly not playing the perception game as much. But um, yeah, the, the, would you agree with that? My logic is that their logic, I guess my guess is that their logic is, yes, like if the Debo thing, they've decided he's not going to be on the team next year, maybe there's a cash crunch knowing what they're going to have to pay IU. You know, they would have to have decided by this point, if they're going to move on from Debo, they have to have IU, right? They got to know they have IU. Uh, and like, you know what, if we've already made this decision, if there's a little bit of a cash crunch with IU's money, Bosa's big money coming, Purdy's big money coming down the road, move off a of Debo next might as well just do it now and get something you mentioned it get the picks now but what would it what would you have what would the pick level have to be in barrels to make sense to move Debo I mean um I would think um a high second I mean I, I mean I think we would kind of gonna find out quickly when, once the second round mm -hmm. begins today um you know just if you go, and I agree with you, I, I actually think it was once the middle of the, the first yeah. round was over yesterday. Jacksonville that, that, 17 as well. I was kind yeah, of thinking exactly, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and and uh, just to reiterate, I mean, yesterday at this time, there were all sorts of reports of 49ers are going to shop Ayuk. It's going to be mm -hmm. hot and heavy in the first round. Wow. I mean, it's going to be spectacular. Lots of action. And, and they did get calls. Um, and they, they were getting calls up until the draft, too. They didn't get any good calls. Nothing came remotely close to what they, uh, what would uh, be required for them to start to consider trading Ayuk, which was a mid first round pick. They got the best that they got was a second round offer. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's a that's a far gap. Um, you go back to uh, to the twenty twenty two draft. The Jets offered a uh, the number ten overall pick for Debo Samuel. Um, the 49ers would have had to send a second rounder, the one that they eventually used on Drake Jackson, back to New York, which is why they they didn't ever seriously consider it. But um, I mean, uh, I'm not I'm not saying that as a you know a slight on uh, Brandon Ayuk and what he's worth, but um, it, you know it, it just kind of speaks to the reluctance of teams to do these sorts of deals. And I just wonder whether the same thing is going to happen today. I mean, everybody's talking about New England at 34. Um, does New England want to give up that pick and plus all the money that you have to pay Debo Samuel? They seem to be to be a rebuilding team. Yep. Um, there are tons of wide receivers still available. My draft crush is right there, <laughs> Adnan Mitchell. Um, Lad McConkey, the guy, uh, there was a lot of comments. Oh, the 49ers. Um, thought that Ricky Pearsall was better than Lad McConkey. Uh, that that surprised a lot of uh, draft analysts. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. Roman Wilson is there. Uh, Keon Coleman is there. So, I mean, if, if you really want a receiver, yeah, I think Debo Samuel is better than all of those guys. But if you're a rebuilding team um, and uh, Debo Samuel is fast approaching, I forget what age he is, but he's, um, you know, this, this would be his – Getting towards uh, 30, getting towards yeah. 30 for sure. Towards yeah. 30. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I, I I don't see the logic of, of a team uh, of, of that team in particular doing it. So we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, but again, soon you're going to be into the mid second round and then late second round. And then once that happens, I, I got to think that, uh, that it's over. Yeah. And plus this new team would probably have to give Debo a new deal. Forget about the money you're right? like, you're not trading the second round pick for somebody who's only going to be on your team for a year or two. Like you got to believe he's going to be on the team for three, four. These trades always happen. Guys get new deals. So like, yeah, that I'm with you. Like they're open to it. Certainly they're open. They did not, you know, made that very clear last night, but are they going to get an offer that's going to make them want to do it? Is it worth that value? And I don't see that either. And it wasn't two years ago when he was coming off that historic season, right? We were two years younger right. coming off a historic season and they get, we'll flip a one for a two. They don't get, here's a one. And so two years later, two not great years at a Debo later when everybody knows you might be able to get him for free next year. Like that's part of the equation too. 
uh, when you probably wouldn't have to give him an, you know, a brand new deal. You might be able to just pick him up after the, you know, with one more year left on his deal. I just don't see where a second round pay comes, comes to play. Maybe a third, but do, I don't think the 49ers do it for a third. You, you, you take that gamble for the third. And maybe you get a really pissed off Debo this year, but you might get a super motivated Debo this year, right? I mean, you might get like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make you show the league what I'm worth. You, maybe you get contract your Debo, which could be very, very interesting. That's what they sort of got two years or three years ago, right? Like, right. oh, yeah, he's coming up on his contract. Here's the other thing I, I, I got this text late last night, and as I was finishing up, so I really couldn't put the gist of it in the column, but I think it felt that way. I, I would imagine you've heard this too that there, there was the emphasis was that they, they want to keep Ayuk if they can, they really want to keep Ayuk if they can. Debo. Not so much. And I, that, that's kind of like dot, dot, dot. I, you, there is still a belief. Well, maybe I shouldn't say belief. There is a hope that they keep, can keep Ayuk. That's still very strong. Uh, I, I think that is kind of the, the counterbalance to all these trade rumors, to all this stuff out there. The 49ers never, just didn't want to trade them. Uh, and, and whether they think this deal is doable by mid-July or mid-August, I don't know. It, it feels like a Bosa thing where it's going to take a long time. But I think they're still very, very – like they think trading Ayuk would hurt them. They really think trading Ayuk would hurt them. Debo, he's somebody they might not have in a year. So trading him isn't as painful. Would you, would you get that same kind of sense from them? Yeah. In fact, I, I've heard that there's been – I mean, they're not close to a deal, but there's been reason for optimism mm -hmm. lately um that uh, things, are, things are starting to, to go a little bit more smoothly and, you know. That could that could change and this that and the other, but um, you know the, the the mere fact that uh, Ayuk was was texting uh, Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch that, that speaks to the fact that you know it's not quite the Cold War that uh, we we might have thought it was uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so I mean, um, all that suggests that what we've thought all along a deal is going to get done at some point. Um, you know, the more uh, Amon, uh, you know, St. Ra, uh, uh, the, the St. Detroit Brown. wide receiver. Amon, yeah. Amon Ra, St. Brown. Yeah. Ra, Ra, St. Brown. Yeah. Not, not an easy one. Um, <laughs> more deals like that get done. The, 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 the more it gets sort of written out what the deal is going to look like. So, I mean, and we, we thought this all along, there's a lot of much ado about, uh, kind of, uh, what we see every, uh, off season with the 49ers. It usually gets done. And, and that's probably the course that this IU deal is going to take as well. It was funny when Lynch did say like, Hey, why is it always us? But uh, there's an answer for that. Cause you never get these deals done, <laughs> right? That, because these deals take so long. This is what adds fire, right? If you would get the deal done, like Detroit, Detroit did with Sewell too, right? They, they get their tackle done. Philadelphia gets their, you know, both receivers done. Like if the 49ers did that, and there's reasons for them not to. I'm not saying it's all or nothing, but the reason why the 49ers are in these discussions every other year, let's say, with with trading one of their good players is because they never signed them until August, right? I mean, that's why. Yeah. Uh, and I think they understand that. I, I'm not saying that John Lynch does not understand that. I'm just saying it was funny when he said that. You you did ask the question that got the response that that. Uh, you did text them because he did play with Pearsall for a year at Arizona State, so I'm sure he's very familiar with them. Uh, I tried to steal it away from you, Barrows, but you fought, you clawed it back. You made. Oh, it I, I had it as the very not even the lead, <laughs> like uh, the first words. I'm like, you can't, you can't take it away now. I, I thought about it. I said, listen, Barrows, I don't care. No, I, I, I defer as always to the beat writer. I always defer to the beat writer. And you got the you got the question anyway, asking them if you'd heard from IU about. Uh, about him and it was good it was a great answer you know he sends him a fire emoji and you know you got, can't lie that it was a great pick um yeah i mean i i think pearsall is interesting because of the way shanahan described him that he can play multiple positions inside outside i'm a little questionable about whether he can play outside he looks really skinny to me he goes up against a big physical corner i, I feel like he's just gonna he might have trouble against that kind of defense not a lot of teams play that but they, you know some teams do they have the real physical good cornerback um but that he can in their minds play either position which is kind of like 
you can replace Ayuk or you can replace Depot. And, and I think that was really important to them that they could picture him anywhere on the wide receiver depth chart. And they know they're going and, and Juwan Jennings, throw him in there too. I know, you know, not the most necessary player in the world to, to replace, but he's somebody that they're, you know, if they don't have him next year, they will have to figure out a way to replace him. That Pearsall may be in a way that other guys like McConkey maybe McConkey's not an outside receiver, right? He is he is a slot receiver. Pearsall, a little bit taller, right? A little bigger. Uh, he's gonna have to put weight on. He is skinny, though, man. That guy is skinny. Um, could play outside or inside, can re- gives them optionality. And I think that was the winning thing for him. Tough no matter what, tough plays at any position. He is toughly tough. And they have some belief that he can be an outside receiver at, at times and be an inside receiver. And I just think that's how he won out for that spot. W- would you think that's about right? Yeah. And, and I think that if, if you're imagining him replacing one of those two guys, it's it's easier to see him playing alongside Ayuk um, than um, a, a Pearsall Samuel starting wide receiver duo. Um you know, he uh, I think he played over 60 percent of his snaps at Florida in the slot. Mm-hmm. So slot is where he, you know, and, and that's because they were uh, he was their best receiver. So there were a lot of um, I don't want to say gimmick plays, but plays designed to get him the ball, which is good. I mean, he's good with the ball in his hands um, and he scored a, a couple of touchdowns, Debo like touchdowns on end arounds. He's usually using his speed more than kind of power and stuff like that, but he's willing. And that was sort of uh, Kyle Shanahan's point yesterday is that this guy, uh, when he's on the field um, is game. I mean, he's, he wants to kind of take on the tackler. Um, He's, you know, trying really hard to break tackles on the, on the tunnel screens and things like that. Um, Shanahan, I, I wrote this in my story. First and foremost, Shanahan wants wide receivers who separate who have got wiggle, who run their routes the right way. That's why he liked Brandon Ayuk uh, four years ago. That's why he liked Dante Pettis in 2018. Mm -hmm. The the distinction between Pearsall and Pettis is that Pearsall is a tough guy. Um, You know, he's not a big guy. And so you you worry about uh, injuries and things like that. And I think that must have been a a worry with Ladd McConkey because you're right. I think Ladd McConkey's maybe 180 pounds uh, and he might be even less than that. And, and he already has injury issues coming out of Georgia. Um, and he's probably nothing more than a slot guy. Uh, Pierce saw not quite as quick as McConkey, but um, fast. And uh, you're right. He's a little bit longer. I mean, there, there are some IU qualities to him mm-hmm. and they, the, the 49ers describes him very similarly to the way that they described IU back in 2020. Uh, can play all three positions, create separation, good route runner, um, willing blocker, all that stuff. Got the right mentality. I mean, I think that that's a big part of it. And I think that's probably a lesson that Shanahan learned from from Pettis. I mean, it's not just all about route running. You have to have a football player's mentality. You have to be, you have to be willing to take contact. And um, that was a that was a theme in some of the. Uh, the answers that Shanahan gave yesterday. Well, one of them was perfect, Kyle, and I should have put it in my column. Uh, that who does he remind you of? <laughs> Myself. Well, <laughs> we could talk for hours about the <laughs> Freudian nature of, of that answer. <laughs> I should have put that in there because it is really telling. It's not that Kyle thought he was a great receiver. Of course, he is acknowledging he was a not good walk on to scholarship receiver at Texas. I guess he got a scholarship from Texas. Um, but it wasn't uh, like he was a heralded recruit uh, and certainly not an NFL value player, but he did, you know, he, there's things about receiving that he did that he values another, like know the scheme gym rat. He called him a Pierce all a gym rat. That is a huge Kyle compliment. Like he's just working his ass off to get the offense, to get the routes, right? He said, you can tell he studied the routes, you can the, the toughness. I don't know how tough Kyle was, and we can show me some tape where he actually was tough on the field. I'm not sure, but uh, he likes to think of it that way. Uh, you know, think like a quarterback, think along with everyone else, and engage, be engaged in every play. And it is so interesting to hear him say that. 
because I think he does look like for those traits. He does look like he look for himself sometimes. And the fact that it's a white receiver, we're not going to get racial here, but I think Kyle can kind of see some identifying traits there. As you said, much faster, much better, much better hands. Um, what a fascinating, what a, what a fascinating comment. God, I wish I put that in my column. I just couldn't well, I mean, the, the the problem was that they they did all this at what ten o'clock at night, yes. so <laughs> we didn't really have the time. I mean, there there's more there that we can uh, we can seize on. Now, Tim, I, I have to say this is going to be a big disappointment to you. I mm -hmm. we were going over the uh, the the betting lines for uh, Luke McCaffrey in our last show. Uh -oh. I got to think that taking <laughs> Ricky Pearsall really kind yes. of sinks the uh, the Luke McCaffrey. There's some, there's some similarities there. Yes, yes. Um, punt returner, slot stuff, you know, the not uh, very big, not very big. Seeing, seeing yeah. yourself uh, in, yes. in, in that re receiver. Um, I, I, it, it would be very surprising if now, if they, if they picked up uh, Luke McCaffrey, unless he, he slips a lot further than we think he might. And he's just sitting there in like the fifth or the sixth round. And um, then you, then you snap him up because he's a good player. You play him on special teams. Yeah, but this is why that odds were ridiculous, right? Because you don't know what they're going to do ahead of that, right? You just don't know. Did you so, go to Reno? Did you put down your, the mortgage on your apartment? Uh, on, the, on the non? Uh, I don't on think the non, can, yeah. yeah. I don't think you can bet that, actually. You got only can only bet on that he will get drafted. I, oh, no, actually, you could have. There was a no, yeah. 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 <laughs> I would have bet that very heavily, as I said at the time. Uh, unfortunately I did not. So I will, I will remain the poor, poor, uh, writer that I am and podcaster, but, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't, you can't bet on them picking anybody, one person in the third round. That's just crazy. Cause you just don't know what else is going to fall. Um, so where do you think they go? Let's, let's say they, they say what 66 they've got in the second round. So yeah. that's pretty late in the second round. It's got to be a tackle. It would be crazy to think that's a tackle. Uh, do they move up if they, you know, the guy, we, we, we all think Rose Garten from Washington is a guy that, that they probably like. What if they feel like he's could go in 50s? Do, do they throw a pick in there to try to jump in and get him? Do they like him that much? Yeah, well, most of the, the pre-draft work that they did seemed to be about, you know, late second round picks. I mean, that was sort of the, the sweet spot as far as, um, the, the draft visitors. And so there were a lot of tackles. So it's not just Rosengarten. Rosengarten didn't actually visit. The 49ers visited him up in Washington. Uh, but he's definitely a, a person to, to look at. Uh, Blake Fisher from Notre Dame. He basically... Do they, was, do they like Notre Dame players at 49ers? They, I, think, I, I think they have a certain <laughs> fondness, yeah. Uh, but he was uh, opposite Alt uh, in, on Notre Dame's line. So Alt, obviously, top 10 pick. Uh, this guy was the right tackle, and usually that means that he's the lesser player, and he probably is. But um, you know, the, the fact that he had such a good teammate suggests that um, maybe Fisher is is pretty good. So there are a handful of of that type of guy. Uh, the BYU tackle Kingsley. I'm not going to try to pronounce his uh, last name quite yet, um, but he's another guy, sort of in that late second round. So I think that they feel like one of those guys will be available. And if they're not, um, then they also looked at cornerbacks there. Um, they looked at defensive tackles there. Uh, Brandon Dorless from Oregon is one. Michael Hall Jr. from Ohio State. These are sort of outside inside guys. These uh, very versatile types of players play them as needed. Carry Heider types, but with uh, a little bit more spring in their step. Uh, at this point. So uh, I think that those uh, those three positions probably will be the positions if they stick where they are in the second and third rounds today. OK, uh, they're sitting there at 31. They take Pearsall. I think we all were surprised you said you liked them. So maybe you were a little more in on it than we were. Would you like Cool and McKinstry's there? Cooper DeJean's there. Like there yeah. are other guys there. Newton, the defensive lineman, might go, you know, 33rd. Right? He might be the first pick of the second round. Where would you have thought the 49ers were going to go? Where's the pick that they might regret passing on? I mean, gee whiz. Um, you, you just go down the line. We'll, we'll have to follow a lot of these guys. Um, David and I did a, a mock draft, and I had Drazon Newton, who's a very uh, Javon Hargrave-like defensive tackle. Um, Grady Jarrett is, is, the, mm -hmm. is the comp for him. Small, but... 
Um, really active, makes a lot of plays in the backfield. Um, you know, I know the 49ers have a lot of bodies on the defensive line right now, but that's going to change soon, especially on the interior. You got guys later in their contracts, um, two guys that you brought in who aren't as good as Eric Armstead. And I just wonder whether you're, you're going to see that at times next year. So he's one. Uh, Cooper DeGene is, is another. I mean, we're talking about cornerback and, um, you know, where things stand at cornerback with the 49ers, Jarvarius Ward, Diamador Lenore, both heading into the final year of their contracts. You mentioned McKinstry at the same position. And then um, I know you don't want to talk about my draft crush anymore, mm-hmm. but you know, we're talk- Adnan Mitchell has number one receiver, not just can play on the outside, but, um, you know, he's he's got – better size, better speed, way more touchdowns, way more big plays than Pearsall had. Now, I will say that Pearsall kind of plays with the spirit that I think that Kyle Shanahan wants and that Adnai Mitchell lacked at times. That's why you got a coaching staff. <laughs> that's why you that's why you yell at these guys. Coach them, coach them. Coach them up. Yeah, that's um, my feeling about tackle too, but go ahead, keep going. Yeah, so that that those those would would be the three. I mean, Lad McConkey is the one that these uh uh these these draft goons, the guys that spend uh, all year uh dissecting the draft um were were wondering about. Oh, if, if you if you chose Ricky Pearsall, why didn't you choose Lad McConkey? He's the superior player. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if his medical scared the 49ers. I don't know if Adonai Mitchell's medical scared the 49ers. You know, there, there are always some things that we don't know about that these teams uh, uh, get scared of. And usually it's medical just scares the bejesus out of these teams. So um, that that could be a, a, a big part of it um, from, from what I know um, or from, from what's been reported. Um, Ricky Pearsall is very clean in that regard. So. Uh, that's something to to think about as well. Hey, it should have scared him about Javon Kinlaw, frankly, uh, three years ago. You yeah, know? I mean, there were issues, you know, that came up, and they needed defensive tackle. I think they just, you know, we're going to take a defensive tackle, and we're going to hope for the best. And that did not prove to be the correct decision. Uh, I don't know that there was a tackle they could have got. Maybe they could, you know, they probably could have moved up and got Guyton, if, but I don't know that they loved him. Uh, my general point is you do need to draft a tackle at some point in the first two rounds. Like that's where you get them. And if you know what you're doing and there's raw talent there, then coach him. That's your point. Coach him. And I, I think they're really picky about tackles. And oh, yeah. And, yeah. And I just, I get it. I mean, you don't want to just force things. I understand, but that's such a premium position. You are going to need, you might need two in two years. And I just think you want them in the pipeline. You want to go through them. It's like a quarterback. You always want quarterbacks in case you need one in a year. You might need one in two years. If it's not working out, you could trade a quarterback. You can always do that. And they don't seem to think that about tackle. I just, you're going to end up really, really needing one pretty soon. And you don't want to be in the position of being desperate for a tackle. Like that is a terrible position to be in. And I just would think just draft a tackle, you know. So maybe in the second round they're going to do that, and maybe they find somebody just as good or almost as good as what they could have moved up to get at twenty-two, let's say. But man, their history is that they're going to pass on, right? Their history is like, no, no, we're not going to do it this year. We'll do it another year. I just at some point you got to draft tackles, and you might they might not be great, and you might regret it in two years. But you need the you you need the accumulation, right? You need like. Let's get two right out of three. Let's get one right out of two instead of zero out of zero. I I just think tackles a position they've really bypassed. And I just think in the NFL, you can't do that. Yeah. Rosengarten will be interesting if he's, if he's sitting there because um, all these teams have certain parameters for what they like at a position and at offensive tackle um, teams, including the 49ers want their tackles to have, 34 inch arms. I mean, that's, that's usually the criteria that they look for. And this guy is, is narrower than um, your, your typical tackle. And um, I think he had the the lowest wingspan of any Mm. draftable tackle in this draft. And that translates to, you know, can you handle power? 
what's going to happen when you've got, um, you know, a, a 275 pound guy who's uh, bull rushing you? Can he anchor against that type of strength? And um, yeah, that seemed to be his weakness at, at Washington. He did not play well against the one team uh, that really had a kind of an, uh, an NFL like defensive front. And that was Michigan. Uh, so I think that's what the 49ers will have to reconcile reconcile themselves with with him in particular. Uh, but it, it speaks to your point that they are picky about that. And they sort of easily kind of talk themselves out of guys. Uh, there were some guys, you know, in, in the third round last year. Remember, they had three yep. third round picks. Uh, Blake Freeland from um, from BYU, tall, skinny, but could really move. I thought that that guy had. 49ers written all over him um and uh they passed and he, he got picked by the Colts who who seem to like a lot of uh players that the 49ers pass on and um you know he he got in got in some action last year and now he's going to be uh in a starting role so I mean to your point if, if the 49ers had done this step last year they would be at a point where one of these guys at least is competing for a starting spot and maybe is the swing tackle and is sort of getting his feet wet for the inevitable uh, retirement of Trent Williams or, or something else. But then they wouldn't have Cam Latu uh, Barrows. So, you know, it's great, there's risk, risk reward. Great point. <laughs> it's a great point. All right. We're getting a little Wi-Fi glitchy here. So let's wrap it up. And if we got to do an emergency podcast where they traded somebody big or something exciting happens, we will. Uh, committed to that, but I think uh, we did just fine with this one. We'll leave this one in the space that it is. It, it exists in the universe where that, that we don't know what's going to happen in the second round. And if it goes according to form, which it almost never does, this is good. And if not, this is the podcast for the moment, and then we'll do another one for the next moment. You got that, Barrows? Got it. Yeah, no problem. I, I love doing these podcasts with you, <laughs> especially good, after we get home at, uh, what, uh, 1230 uh, in the morning. Well, the point of this one is so we don't have to do another one. Let's do this. <laughs> this is nailed down and we don't have to come back and do it again unless Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch have a little surprise for us. So, All right, everybody. Show for today. Thank you.